Welcome to Symphony Workshop, I'm Gary Clark and this is a new recording in the Symphony Components series. In this one I'm going to cover the Symphony Cache Component in both a standalone non-framework PHP project and also in a Symphony Framework project. If you don't know much about caching, it's a technique to manage frequently accessed data in a memory. So it gives quick access to data other than having to read from a database and files etc. All of this can enhance performance as well as improving the scalability and availability of an application and the Symphony Cache component makes it a total breeze to set this up and use. Let's do this. Some information first, I record in high resolution so you don't need to watch on a blurry screen. Choose high definition if that works for you. Would you like to join a growing group of PHP developers and take your skills to a new level? If that sounds like you, all you need to do is subscribe and click the little notification icon and welcome. I'm going to start off with the non-Symphony Framework example. So what we're going to need is Symphony Cache Component. So I can compose or require Symphony forward slash cache. And in order to demonstrate and dump things out, I'm also going to require one of my favourites, Symphony File Dumper. Then I'm going to need a playground to demonstrate this stuff. So I'll stick to a typical project file structure. I'll create a public folder and inside of that I'll create an index.php file. And we'll probably keep most of our code inside of that in order to demonstrate this here. Just need my opening PHP tags and then I'm going to require one to the autoload file which can be found in the vendor directory. So if you've placed everything in the same place as me you can just copy the same path. And then I'll explain to you how the caching works. First you need a mechanism, a system, something which is going to store the data in the memory. So for that you can use things like memcache, redis, apcu. What we're going to start off with here is the file system. It's the slowest but it's also the easiest to set up and get up and running and show you the mechanics of how we cache things. In order to hook into those mechanisms we need an adapter. An adapter will translate PHP into a language which the mechanism understands. That's simply what adapters do. The other two major parts are the cache pool, which from a cache perspective we shall refer to as the cache, and then the cache items. These are the items which you place inside the cache. Sounds complex, but it's not, it's really simple. Let's write some code and you'll see exactly what I mean. So like I say, we're going to start off with file system caching because it requires no setup. We can just get up and running and I can show you how you do it from a code perspective. What we're going to do later on is have a look at uh, Redis also when we look at caching within the Symfony framework itself. So cache equals new file system adapter which comes from Symfony component cache adapter file system adapter. Then we need a cache item. The way we create a cache item is to say cache get item. So we get an item from the cache in the same way as we create one. So if it, the item isn't found in the cache it creates this new item anyway. If the item was already in the cache, it's considered a hit. So the way we see if it was already in the cache is we ask cache item is hit. So what we're saying here is if the cache item isn't a hit, we're going to perform an action. And what we're actually going to do is save some data in the cache. So this is PSR6 standard for PHP caching. As you can see, these are the data types. All the usual suspects there, strings, integers, floats, boolean, null, arrays, or objects. So if you're trying to cache something which isn't on the list, either you're not ready for caching or caching ain't ready for you, either way you're doing something pretty strange. But what we're going to do is start off by caching a string. What I'm going to do is mimic the creation of an API key by just creating the MD5 hash of a string. Foo will do us for this example. And then what we do is we set the value of the cache item. So the cache item isn't the value, the cache item has a value. Very important to know that concept. And then what you do is you save the cache item to the cache or to the cache pool. So it might seem like quite a lot of different terminology there, but genuinely there's about four things to remember. And by the end of this couple of recordings, you'll know this stuff off by heart, I promise you. So that's what will happen if the item isn't found, i.e. it isn't a hit. If it is, then what we'll do is we'll just get the value. And the way we do that is with cache item get. And we'll store that in the API key variable. So either way, we're going to get back an API key. 
and we'll also have a cached API key. So I'm going to echo out hit if it's a hit, just so that when we run this we know what's happened. And what I'll do is if it's a miss, I'll echo out miss. So it should be clear every step of the way whether we've retrieved something from the cache or whether we've actually just had to create it ourselves in the cache. Hopefully that's clear. Let me start up a PHP localhost server and a demonstration should make everything clear in your mind as to how this works. What I expect is that the first time we should see miss because there's no item in the cache, but then when I refresh the browser, then I should see hit because on that occasion it should be retrieving it from the cache. So as you can see, first time we run it, we see miss, which means that this code here will be executed and the item will be saved to the cache. Let's refresh. And now we see hit because we're actually retrieving the item from the cache and it will stay in the cache until we either delete it or it time expires. We'll cover both of those things shortly. Let's dump out the key just for a bit of extra feedback and watch the refresh icon as I hit it each time. As you can see, we're getting a hit every time because we're getting it from the cache. We're not creating it. Let's try a different data type. Let's do an array just to demonstrate that you can do all different types. So what I'll do is mimic some account details. So we'll have a name and an ID. Name is Gary Clark and we'll have an ID of one, two, three, four. And we'll call this account instead of API key. So I need to change those things. We're using the same methodology here. We're looking for it to see if there's an item in the cache. If not, we're going to create it. What I didn't put much emphasis on when I described this at first is the cache key. So the cache key is what is used to uniquely identify that item in the cache. So we'll change this to user.account. What I would say with the keys is use names that are meaningful, put some thought into it because you're going to need to manage this stuff. Okay, first go, we see miss. Let's refresh this, hit. Let's refresh it again. It. There you go. That's an introduction to caching in a standalone project. We're going to come back to this, but now let's switch over to a Symfony project and I'll show you some other stuff, including a way of simplifying all of this. So, inside of my Symfony components folder, I'm saying Symfony new cache, cache being the name of the project. What I'll do is I'll switch into there and I've taken the liberty of adding a couple of files from a previous project. This is from my task driven stuff. Um, that I did so I've got a stock entity and a stock repository I'll put a link to a github repo where you can go and grab this stuff so you can clone the repo or you can just copy the content of the files and paste it into your own project entirely up to you how you do that that was a stock entity this is the repository and as you can see PHP Storm isn't happy with me it's underlining these uh, service entity repository and manager registry because we need the ORM pack. And I get that with Symfony Composer Require Doctrine. That will install everything that I need there and hopefully those lines should go away. Great stuff. Now there's just a couple more steps and then we're up and running. What I've done is I've set up a database which I've called Cache Demo, but I need to migrate it and I need to create the migration, which I do with Symfony Console Doctrine Migrations Diff. And then in order to migrate it, it's Doctrine Migrations Migrate. It'll ask me if I'm sure. I am sure. This is my cache demo database. This is a stock table. I'll populate it with some records. So I've gone for Apple, Tesla, Shopify, and Amazon. And the name of the game here is I want to hit an endpoint for any of these stocks. If the stock is cached in memory, then it'll be grabbed from memory. If not, we'll have to go and query the database and grab it from there. So if you're running a site where you're updating stock, uh, regularly or the price regularly it might be best to cache them in memory if it's something that's going to be requested quite a lot for X amount of time and then once it expires from the cache you can go and get it from the database I hope that sounds like fun to you we'll have to get a little application up and running to do that let's start with the controller so I'm just going to call this app controller and it's going to be found in the namespace app controller and I have just one method which I'll imaginatively call stock so public function stock, and this is going to handle our one and only route. I want to be able to dynamically retrieve the stock based on the URL that the user entered. So I'm going to use param binding. If you're unfamiliar with that, you can go and watch my routing video. But basically what I do is this. So I'm saying stock forward slash and then symbol within curly braces. So that string there will be the symbol as it relates to in the database. And then I'm going to name the route get stock. And I'm also going to say that the method must be a get. 
Another advantage of pram binding symbol is that we can also use it as our cache key. So symbol here in the URL gets stored in the symbol variable. We're also going to need an entity manager because if the item isn't in the cache, we're going to have to go and get it from the database. If any of this routing stuff or any of the database stuff, entity manager is unclear, just go and check out some of my other videos. I've done series on doctrine and routing. As you can see, I'm making sure that symbol is uppercase because that's how it's stored in the database. I've set things up exactly the same way that I did in the standalone project here, but I'm going to show you a more streamlined way of doing it. This method was available to us in the standalone project. There's nothing different about um, the cache package that we're using here, but I'm just deciding to show it you here. So the way we do it is we say cache get and we pass the key as the first argument. As the second argument, we have a callback. Inside of this callback function, we write the code which we want to execute should an item not have been found in the cache. However, if an item was found in the cache, then the get method just returns that item and we have our stock. So, assuming now that no item was returned, we're going to need to figure out a way of A, getting that item and B, also caching it for the future. I might come in out the miss so that we have that feedback and what I'm going to need is the actual symbol and I'll need the entity manager in order to retrieve the items from the database when we do get that miss. I'm going to need my stock repository to get the item from the database. I can get that with entity manager get repository and then I pass in the name namespace of the stock entity. I shall call the find one by method on the repository using the symbol as the field that I want to find one by and I'm going to return that and by returning that value I'm setting it to a cache item and I'm also saving a cache item to the cache. Just going to add a line in here so that I get some auto completion and then what I want to do is return a response which contains information about the stock which has been retrieved either from the cache or from the database if it was the first time that this has run. And so we'll go with the name of whatever stock has a current value of, and then we'll call get price on the stock. So part of the PSR6 standard is that items going into the cache should come out exactly in the same format as when they went in. And this should prove that. So just to recap what we're doing here, we're trying to get a stock. If it's in the cache, it'll return it. If not, we execute this code and then we're just going to return a response which includes that stock. Hopefully all that's clear. If you do have any questions, comments or feedback at this stage, then leave those in the comments below because I do read and respond to them all. I'm starting up a Symfony server, so I'll grab that URL and then what I'll need to do is append stock and then the symbol on the end of it. So I've already had a test run with Amazon, so this should already be in the cache. As you can see, we're not getting the um, miss being signified there. Let's change it to Tesla and see if we get anything different with that one. It will help if I get the symbol correct. It's meant to be TSLA, not TLSA. So TSLA, there we go, it's a miss. Tesla Inc. has a current value of 698. Let's also try Shopify. And so that is a miss. And if we refresh it, the miss disappears. So it's grabbed that from the cache on the second time. And then I think we'll also have a go with Apple. So one thing you should know regarding objects is if you're only using a couple of values like the name and the price like we are here, you don't need to save the whole object. With databases, you'll find that it's, people tend to err on the side of caution and save maybe more data than what they need to. But when you're storing stuff in the cache, because it's going to be in memory, just store the minimum amount of data that you need to. Let me show you how you delete items. It don't get any easier than this. Cache, delete, pass in the key name, and then let's go over to the browser and give this a whirl. So thinking of our logic, the first time I refreshed it, as I did there, this won't be deleted, but when I do it a second time, it should be deleted, and then we go on to miss. Uh, I hit that a couple of times, and as you can see, it's deleting it each time, so it stays out of the cache. So that's how we remove a single item from the cache. If we want to clear out the whole lot, we use cache clear. And so we'll try this with a other stock in order to demonstrate this. We'll do it with Tesla and it says miss. And another way to remove items from the cache is to set an expiry on the item when it's created. So as you can see, an item is being passed in here. What I can do is call methods on this. 
One of them is called expires at and one is expires after. So what I'll demonstrate first is expires after. And what we do is we just give it a lifespan. I can do that by passing in a number of seconds. So I'm going to make this an hour, which is 3,600 seconds. Or you can pass in a date interval. And if you do that, of course, you can say things like one day, 12 hours, whatever, and it'll figure out exactly what time to expire it at. The other method is expires at. This takes a date time instance and this is for expiring something at a given date. So quite a common one might be at the end of the day, in which case I can do that by saying date create. And then I don't put midnight because that will mean it has already expired. I put tomorrow. That means it will expire at the end of the current date. Both of those really useful methods and they take care of the clear up without you having to manually do anything. I think we're going to take a pause there because we've covered quite a bit and there's still quite a lot to come and we're at 15 minutes. In the next one we'll do a bit more work on this Symphony Framework project. We'll also switch back to our standalone one. We'll have a look at tagging, we'll have a look at namespacing and we'll also pull in Redis and have a go at storing stuff in the Redis cache. So that's all going to be pretty cool. I hope you've enjoyed this one because I've enjoyed making it for you. Give it a thumbs up if so. I don't hesitate to share if you want to help out other developers like yourself. That's what good developers do. One other thing, if you want YouTube to show you more of my content, all you need to do is subscribe and click the little notification icon. I release new recordings two times a week and details on my schedule can be found on the discussion tab of my YouTube channel homepage. See you in part two.